VJ Edgecombe, Baylor Bear. It's got a nice ring to it. This is a live version of Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Baylor, a very special bonus edition for you on this Sunday night because boom, bang, got it. VJ Edgecombe, the number five player in the country and a legitimate five star in the class of 2024, has just committed to Baylor over Duke, over Kentucky. You might have heard of them. He says, to heck with them. I'm going to Baylor. I'm playing for Scott Drew. I'm playing at the Foster Pavilion. I'm going to go be a lottery pick. I'm going to win a national championship. That's what he's telling America. Bang! Yes! What a huge win! Huge win! Good golly, Miss Molly. Whoo! I got to be honest with you guys. I... I, I've known about VJ Edgecombe for a while, but he wasn't, I wasn't like as hot on his trail as I was with Trey Johnson. Trey Johnson was the number one player in the nation. It got down to 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 us and UT. He ended up picking UT. And just silently, kind of in the background, VJ Edgecombe's still there, slumming it as the number five player in all of the world in high school basketball. And it comes out over the weekend that he's not even thinking about Kentucky anymore. Think about that. Kentucky didn't even make it to the final stage with Baylor. And then he picks Baylor over what is undoubtedly the best college basketball program of the last 35 years. He chose Baylor over them. And isn't it special, too, that it's in the halftime of a Montverde game Um which has Cooper Flag, Duke, and Rob Wright, Baylor. By the way, Rob Wright, nice first half. He looked really good, actually. Um, Dishon, I think he had four assists, seven points, had a steal in there, um, looked really good. And for me personally, this is a personal anecdote here, to see such a highly touted player commit to Baylor over Duke and to do it in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts for me would be just extra tingly. This is this is huge. I mean, Baylor was set up pretty well in this 2024 class anyway. And it just got that much better. This is going to put them in the top 10. And, I mean, we'll have one of the very best classes when you look at the way these guys project. Jason Asimota, Rob Wright, and now VJ Edgecombe. Um, just what a win for Baylor. And for VJ, I mean, it, it looks, you know... it. It seems simple when you just look at the last five years. The guards that this program has developed and the lottery picks this program has developed, it makes it pretty easy. Now, of course, the alternative is Duke, and they've been doing that for decades. And I think John Shire is a pretty darn good coach. I really do. But if we're putting him up against Scott Drew, the way Baylor's on a heater the last half decade, we're going to win that matchup. And we just did. Golly, this is so huge. I mean, those three, I I think they have four total, but those three that I've mentioned, Edgecombe, Asimota, and Wright, those are NBA players, man. It's not just good, gritty college players, which we'll have plenty of those. Scott Drew always does, but you've got three NBA guys out there as freshmen. And look, I this is a long shot, but... um. There is a there is a world where Eve Misi comes back. I, I doubt it. Um, I think he and Jacoby probably could really benefit from a second year, but I, I think they'll both be NBA lottery pick type of guys. By the way, speaking of Jacoby, Edgecombe reminds me a lot of him. Um, he Jacoby is a better shooter. Um, he's he's an elite shooter. He's an NBA shooter right now. Um, but the rest of his offensive game is very similar to what Edgecombe puts out on tape. Edgecombe's a good shooter. He's, he's not as good or as polished a shooter as Jacoby Walter is. Um, but 
great basketball instincts, can get to the rim whenever, which we've seen from Jacoby, especially in the last few games, where his just basketball instincts are off the charts. And that is something that it is not always easy uh, to, to translate into college. And I'll look back at that national championship team. This is not a diss on any of those guys because they were all great, great college players. But it, it took time for Jared Butler and Davion Mitchell and Macy Oteague to really feel out the college game. Of course, we saw Butler do that at Baylor. The other two started somewhere else. Uh, Adam Flagler is another example of guys who were good players but really needed to adjust both physically and a little bit mentally to the college game. Jacoby Walter didn't need to do that, and VJ Edgecombe, I don't think, needs to do that either. I'm going to read off his scouting report from 24-7 um, because – it's, it's just so special to read and see that this kid's actually coming to Baylor. This is from Adam Finkelstein, who is like the top uh, assessor of high school talent for 24 um, seven. And he says, Edgecombe is an athletic scorer on the wing with developing guard skills. He's a terror in transition who puts a ton of pressure on the rim and can rise up for the type of highlight finishes that few others can make. That's the first thing that pops up. If you watch his highlights, he's just Speed, but always in control, uh, which is something again that that not every high schooler uh, it has that ability. You know, you see the top recruits, and they're always super athletic. But I said this a lot about Trey Johnson as well. Edgecombe and Trey Johnson are basketball players who are also very, very athletic. Um, what else does he say? He's a well-rounded athlete with quick reactions throughout his floor game, multiple jumps, and natural strength. Even as he continues to fill out his frame, he is only six five, one eighty. Only, I mean, this kid is going to be jumping through the gym next year. That's about what Jacoby Walter's at. His skill set is a work in progress. He tends to be most efficient right now when looking to score, but clearly wants to develop his total guard skills. Again, the antenna's going off. Jacoby Walter. He gets good lift into his mid-range jumper and is capable, if not ultra-consistent, shooter from behind the three-point line. Even when he's not hammering big dunks, dunks, he's an impressive finisher who utilizes mid-air body control and dexterity alike. There's been clear progress with his handle and his passing, uh, but can still be turnover-prone at times, and his left hand needs work. Defensively, he has all the tools and just the right competitive mentality to emerge on that end of the floor. Bang, I'm in. I'm, I'm so in. I am so in. That was before this season that that came out, by the way. he His stock has risen so much even throughout this season um, up there on Long Island. Long Island Lutheran is where he plays. He is originally from the Bahamas. Um, and something that if you watched his uh, commitment at halftime of that game, something that stands out to me and, and really can't be understated, he's an international guy, which does really well at Baylor with Scott Drew. Huge. Um, Second, you know, big family guy. He always mentions his family in there um, already. I mean, most programs like to have a family atmosphere, but we see it consistently at Baylor. And they, the announcer said, hey, I know you have a bunch of people to thank right now, a bunch of people you want to shout out. Floor is yours. Go ahead and do it. And he said, first per person I need to thank is, is God. Doesn't get much more Baylor than that, guys. Doesn't get much more Baylor than that. Oh, VJ Edgecombe. Baylor Bear. We're also going to talk a little bit about that game on Saturday. If you're listening to this on Monday, yesterday, if you're live with us right now. So we'll go to the comments. If you have anything to say about VJ or that game that went over Cincinnati yesterday, uh, have at it. Throw off in the comment section. Scotty B says, forget about Trey Johnson. We got someone at the same level. You're right. You're right. Um, there might be some parts of Trey's game that are a little bit more polished, but we're really splitting hairs. I mean, we're talking about number one versus number five or, you know, number two, wherever you put Trey Johnson. Um, so you're right. I mean, to not many programs, especially ones like Baylor, who are not of those blue bloods just yet, can miss out on a top five guy in Trey Johnson and bring in another top five guy in that same cycle at the same position. Trey committed in what, November? Like, a lot of these top prospects know where they're already going by then, before their senior year. And still the others who haven't chosen yet are usually turned off by the fact that there's another five-star guy at their position looking at that school and in the top three of that school. That's what Baylor had to overcome in this, in this recruiting battle, and they did, and they won. 
And Scotty B says, Noah Boyed is the, is the fourth one. Yes. Is he the Juco guy? Let me know down, uh, Scotty. I think he might be the, the, the big, tall, almost seven footer Juco guy who is, was drawing a lot of attention. Samuel says, it's a great night to be a Baylor bear. Y'all you're so right. You're so right. Men are undefeated in the conference. They've got this great home court advantage. And now we just get a top five recruit in, in the country. Biggie Cheese, one of my favorite commenters. In my completely biased opinion, I think we are next up to become the newest blue blood of college basketball. Certainly sets up that way, Biggie. It really does. And the blueprint for a school like Baylor, um, really the two that come to mind for me that have been able to have staying power are Duke, which is the, the biggest and best example, of course, and Villanova. And, you know, Villanova... They go, whatever, 30 years between national championships before they won those two under Jay Wright, but they were always in it. They were always a good team, um, you know, whereas Georgetown has completely fallen off, and I, I guess Syrac Syracuse is bigger than Baylor, but I guess you can use that as an example. They've completely fallen off now, but they've they had a really good run there. Um, it, it's going to take some more deep tournament trips, of course, but this is how you start building those. You get the arena. You get the great recruits. I mean, you've got great recruits this year. You had great recruits last year and the year before. So that is really starting starting to build up. Samuel also says Langston has more eligibility as well, right? That is right. He does. Yeah. And this leads me to an interesting point. Um, so Jaden Nunn is done after this year. And Langston Love's coming back. Miro Little's obviously coming back. And Dantuan Grimes is out the door. Now, I, I don't have any expert intel on this, but usually these teams will know a couple of days ahead of time with a real degree of certainty where the kid is leaning. And I think bringing in Rob Wright and VJ Edgecombe probably had a little something to do with Dantuan Grimes saying, I'm probably going to find some shine somewhere else here. Uh, can't blame him for that, but I have to imagine that plays a part in it. And so you're looking at those guards for next year. It's Wright, it's Hedgecomb, it's uh, Miro Little and Langston Love. That 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 is a good outlook. Um, and Asamoda is a guy who looks like he is still a ball handler, even being at, I think he's 6'8", 6'9". So um, that, that is a really good outlook um, for Baylor. Oh, I stand corrected. Scotty B keeps up with these things a little bit more than I do. He says none has a year left too. So that's good. I love that um, because he's someone who is developing by the game. So appreciate that, Scotty. Uh, Samuel, again, God, this roster is going to be loaded. It already is, but great to see it's going to continue to be. You're right on with that one. And Baylor has hit an awesome balance here with, and college basketball has leveled this out a little bit too the last few years, but Gone are the days of Duke and Kentucky and sometimes Kansas bringing in five, four or five star guys. And that's your lineup next year. Um, Baylor has found a really great medium of keeping some talented players around while also bringing in these ultra talented kids out of high school. So, you know, you talk about that and, and, and it, you talk about the guards with, Edge coming right, and then Asamoda coming in as a forward as well. Uh, you'll lose Jalen Bridges, but you're bringing back Jaden Nunn and Langston Love and Josh Ojanwuna, who had a really nice game against Cincinnati. Uh, like this is <laughs> this is real nice. And, and, and again, it's a long shot, but still, maybe Eve Misi or Jacoby Walter coming back. I wouldn't I wouldn't bank on it, but that would be scary, scary good. Uh, and I got confirmation from Scotty. Noah Boyd is the JUCO guy. So that would be um, your, your backup at center. It looks like the Josh O. So still thin at that position at center. We'll see. Um, they'll bring in, um, a, a, I'm sure, another JUCO guy or a guy in from the transfer portal the way when they needed Jalen Bridges two years ago, they brought him in from the transfer portal within the conference. So um, that's big. And Caleb Lohner still has another year. Chris Bowers says... Who will be the main point guard? Good question. Um, if you had to ask me right now, I would actually probably say Miro Little, a guy who was a 
a decent prospect last year. You know, not a huge time prospect. I, I don't know that he ever got to four stars. Um, but one who has filled in these minutes admirably that would have gone to D'Antoine Grimes, um, I, I think he is more of a pure point guard than Langston Love is, although Love has shown some some uh, some good potential at point guard. So uh, either way, they'll be all set with that. But I, I would guess Miro Little, he's more of a natural point guard. Um, but we'll see. Rob Wright's also a natural point guard who is who was terrific in the Philadelphia area and then goes to Montverde this year, one of the top prep programs in the nation, and really hasn't missed a beat. So um, you have no shortage of options at point guard. Um, and I think Miro Little will probably be the guy that you'll see there. Sorry, I had to put in that, that bill. Sorry about that. Samuel says, while we're at it, starting five prediction, let's just say Misi comes back. All right, let's say Misi comes back because that would be humongous. In that case, it would, hmm, and this is very early days. I'd really have to think about this, but okay. So if Misi comes back, I'd assume Walter is gone. Obviously, Bridges is gone. So I would say Miro Little, um, VJ Edgecombe with a bit of a, a bit of a edge over Rob Wright at the other guard because I think he is more of a two guard than Rob Wright is, but Rob Wright will get plenty of minutes. And then I'm looking at Asimoda, Misi, and hmm. Hmm. I would say Langston Love. I'd say you go with three guard set and put Langston Love out there because he can be pretty physical uh, too. And yeah, that's the way I would go with. Oh, but Scotty brings up a good point that I kept forgetting because in my head before this podcast, I thought he was done. Jade Nunn would probably could, could be your point guard. He absolutely could be. Um, Miro, I don't think is going to be a guy who enters the draft after next season. I, I hope I'm wrong because that would mean he has a really good season. Um, but absolutely, you could see Jaden Nunn um, at the point, which makes me wonder. I mean, Jaden Nunn starting right now is he is he your two guard? starting next year and you have Edgecombe and uh, Rob Wright on the bench. I, I doubt that. I just don't, I just don't see a world where both of those guys are on the bench. Uh, by the way, I said, we'd mention it. We got a couple minutes here. Um, huge win for Baylor on Saturday. Uh, huge, not in that you're taking down a top 10 team, but I just love the way they responded in game and the adjustments that they made in game uh, against Cincinnati Cincinnati is a good team, good, not very good, not great. Um, and I know it's kind of if, ands, or buts, but if one bounce goes the other way for them in either of those two games this week, they're probably in the rankings. They were receiving votes this week um, after beating BYU and holding them to their lowest season total. And then uh, they lost to Texas by one and then lost to Baylor by three. So they're right up there. They're going to be a team that's in the rankings. They're going to knock off some good teams in this conference. Um, what I will say about them is, I, I said this about Tech before uh, under Mark Adams, they would be the best team in the, they would be the best basketball team in the country if the game was played without a basketball. <laughs> like everything else they do well. They defend really well. They're physical. They can rebound. They came into that game yesterday with, the second best rebounding differential in the entire country. And Baylor went dead even with them on the game. They, they tied in rebounds. So um, that that's, that's a really good look for Baylor, who I think has struggled at times rebounding the ball. Um, it's much better than it was last year, but a game like that shows that they can play physical and rebound. Again, I really liked the performance from Josh O. Uh, would have been nigh on perfect if he hadn't taken that shot in the last minute. I think the announcer said it. I was at the game, but someone told me the announcer said it. There's a reason you're that wide open, man. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, but he was excellent um, when Eve Misi was in foul trouble. I mean, he played almost the whole second half. He he was banging down low. He was he was he had a really good night. And obviously, the big switch in game was to the zone defense. They flashed it on two or three possessions in the first half. I thought it worked out well. They went almost entirely to it in the second half, which meant um, a lot more Langston Love than Jaden Nunn. It meant more Josh O than Eve Misi. Um, and it worked. It worked like a charm. I mean, that that's what's going to work against teams like Cincinnati. 
And it was really Scott Drew challenging the Bearcats by saying, you guys can't hit threes. We know you can't hit threes. The easiest way to beat his own defense is to shoot over it. We don't think you can do that. And he was right. Um, and I really do. I like I, I like the job Wes Miller has done at Cincinnati. Um, they're just not quite there yet. Um, I'm trying to think of a good comparison. I guess Tech would have been the one under Beard. But what impresses me, and this is going to sound like a slight, it's not, but they don't have they don't have the talent that the rest of the big teams in the Big 12 have. They don't have the talent that Baylor has. They don't have the talent that that BYU or Texas has. But in each of those three games, they have had a not significant amount of the game where they have pulled the opponent down to their level and made them play their game. They called it, what, nasty and gritty. And that's exactly what it was on Saturday, man. I mean, they... They were just in your face defensively. They're not a three-point shooting team. They're not a finesse team. They're going to take it at your chest, and they're going to play physical with you. And for a good portion of that game, the refs let them play on both sides, which I'm okay with. If you if it's both sides, let them play. This is the Big 12, baby. Um, and I don't think they had a real gripe with the refs. Um, anyway, that's a decent team in Cincinnati. I, I'm interested to see how West Miller develops it over the next two seasons here. Um, to kind of put out a five-year window because I think he's already in year three. They'll get they'll get better. They'll be in the rankings this year, and I imagine that will continue into next year as well. So, uh, good team. I say that to say it's a good win for Baylor. They made adjustments in game. They handled a very good defensive team, and they made enough plays at the end. 62 is, is not you know a high watermark for them, uh, but... It is it is good the way they adjusted at the half. 35 points in the second half as opposed to 27 in the first half. And if they play defense the way they did on Saturday, they're they're gonna win. Uh they're gonna win a lot of games in the Big 12 that way. But that's what it has to be now. I mean, we can't say, oh, Bayward didn't beat a team by 15. You can't say that. The, the Big 12 is that good. I'm serious. And I'm harder on them than, than most people are. So uh it's it's a it's a good place to be for Baylor right now. It was a good win on Saturday. I really liked it. Loved the environment in the Farrell Center. A little mum in the first half, uh, but they got proactive as a crowd in the second half. The towels were great. Keep bringing those out, Baylor. I know you're telling people to keep bringing them, you know, the ones that were at the game. How about you figure this out and you get towels on the seats for every game because it worked out really well. Scotty B, looking ahead to Tuesday, says, time to get ready for an angry K-State team who lost to Tech by one on the last play where the clock didn't start. K State took a last late took a late shot and Tech got the rebound. The refs reviewed the clock. Yeah, it was a kind of a wild end to that game the other day. Um, K State's good, which uh, Chris is asking as well. How are we feeling about uh, Tuesday in Manhattan versus K State? Um, I'm not going to give you the full breakdown yet because I don't know it. I've only seen K State play like half of one game this year, so that's going to be Tuesday's show. We're going to break that down. Um, it's not an easy place to play. Uh, it it really isn't. I think Baylor is on on a good run right now, and they're feeling good about themselves. But not an easy place to play. You lost both games to Jerome Tang last year, um, so this was this is a this is a better team than last year for Baylor. Uh, so honestly, I don't I don't know just yet. I mean, if you made me pick right now, I would say Baylor in a tight one because that's that's what the Big Twelve is. But uh, I'm gonna have to look more into what that matchup looks like uh, for Tuesday's show on that. So it's um. It's just that kind of conference. And I talk about it on tomorrow's show, Monday's show um, of Locked On Baylor with Drake Toll. We did a little crossover with Locked On Big 12 to just talk about how great this conference is. It, it sounds cliche at times, but it really is. Any given night, anybody can beat anybody, um, which is really good. Uh, oh, speaking of, uh, you talk about the end of that Kansas State game. The only thing I, I have to critique Wes Miller for at the end of that game was he ran a play with 15 seconds left. He ran a well-designed play for if you're inbounding the ball with three seconds left. Okay, so they're down one, right? And they have the ball with like 30, 35 seconds left at first, and they call a timeout. They draw a great play. Uh, frees up a guard to get to the basket. He misses the layup. Um, they get the rebound. I think call another timeout. And... They have it with 15 seconds left. They're down one, 
and they run whatever, a double screen to get a kid open towards the inbounder for a wide open three. It's a great look, but you don't shoot threes well. You're only down one, and you have 15 seconds left. I just I didn't understand that call. Um, Baylor comes down, hits the two big free throws, which was no were no gimmies because this team shoots around 70% from the free throw line every night, and it's frustrating as holy heck, man, because they need to be better at that. Um, down the stretch, but nice win for Baylor. The Cincinnati did get a couple of looks at the end there, but good win for Baylor. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about VJ Edgecombe, Baylor Bear, ba noted Baylor Bear, VJ Edgecombe, and if that changes, if that changes your opinions on this team a little bit, um, I, I should say talking about Saturday's game, if that changes your opinion on this team, I don't think it should. I think this is a good sign for Baylor. Um, and so many teams went down this weekend that Baylor's just going to move up. I mean, really Ken Palm's all that matters anyway, but that AP poll, they're going to move up big time. Houston, another loss. Uh, TCU looks better by the game. Um, I, I genuinely, I have a conspiracy theory that the people voting on the big 12 rankings and the preseason top 25 rankings I think got UT and TCU mixed up. I mean, TCU gets three ranked opponents right out of the gate. They should win in Kansas. They don't um, at Fog Allen. And then they beat top 10 OU. They beat number two Houston. That's a dangerous team. Iowa State is a really dangerous team. They just knocked off Houston the game before. Uh, this conference is bananas. You can't take anything for granted. I went over the schedule on Friday. Uh, Baylor doesn't have a landing spot for like another month and a half when they play West Virginia or whatever that game is. And by the way, they just beat Texas. The most hapless team in this conference just beat Texas. Oh, it, it's nuts. Anyway, be sure to leave your uh, comments down in the comments below. Any comment helps, but let me know what you think about VJ Edgecombe. I, I'm serious and, and, and what this team is going to look like next year and what Baylor needs to work on going forward. They, they were even in rebounds against Cincinnati, but they lost the turnover battle. And there were times where they couldn't get a good look at the basket. What needs to improve for this team? What do you think about this game Tuesday against K-State? I'm going to have the full breakdown of that on Tuesday, day of the game. Tomorrow's show, Monday, we are talking with Drake Toll from Locked On Baylor about the, the absolute state of this conference and also a little bit more on VJ Edgecombe. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, it's a it's a fun time to be a Baylor basketball fan right now. It it really really is. We'll have more about that tomorrow and on Tuesday before the Bears uh, play in the Whittle Apple. They're already there against Jerome Tang's Wild Wildcats. Anyway, this is Locked On Baylor. <laughs>